by Reverend Marty Warren.
Alicia, I promise you a record deal is coming. Just be a little patient. And the Super Bowl. Before I forget, um, please, everyone, if you have cell phones with you today, if you could please turn them off or silence them. We would appreciate it. Thank you. Back by popular demand, singing the Negro National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, is Denisha Riley Red. Thank you very much for coming. 
from here today. Uh, I get to take your pleasure and an opportunity and in fact an honor to introduce someone who is very, very special to the Independent Club, who is a dear friend of mine, and who is really, really instrumental in the way that Woodbridge has been moving forward over the past several years and that it's continuing to move forward. So without further ado, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce to you the Honorable Mayor John E. McCormick Johnson. November of 2006, a little over seven years ago. 149 Delaware was just an empty, vacant building that needed a lot of work. And over the last seven years, thanks to the leadership of Phil and the rest of the club, it's become a home. It's become a great facility with great people that do great things for our township. I look around, I see people on the Mayor's Advisory Committee. Phil Hall himself is the uh, president of our affordable housing corporations, doing a great job. The club gets involved in tooling around the township. The club gets involved in our cleanups in Colonia, both in the spring and the fall, and all kinds of different places where you've uh, helped our Woodbridge Township. We greatly appreciate that. I'm proud to say that uh, I don't think he's here yet, but the first African American council in the history of Woodbridge Township is now our council president, Mr. Kyle Ennis. We're very, very proud of that. Kyle's become a very good friend of mine, and we uh, work very well together in the two branches of government, executive branch and legislative branch, and he's been doing a fantastic job. We also have our very first African American elected to the Board of Education, Monica Michelle Smith. So I really want to just say today, thank you for all that you do for uh, Woodbridge Township. We have a great community. There's Vito Samuka, our recreation director. But thank you, Vito. So Admiral Carter, Admiral, please stand up. I got Bill Stevens' son, he used to be a fantastic police officer in town, went over to a different school district, now he's back as vice principal of uh, Woodbridge High School, doing a fantastic job there. Okay. 
So that's very well important. So congratulations. Uh, and Mary mentioned about the, the Colonial and the Independent Club and you know how far we've come. Uh, I have to be honest with you also, our first Black History program that was put together by Roger Paul took place at the Independent Club. It was about 75 people. We had about 100 people there. The mayor leaned over to me that day and said, Phil, you got to think about a bigger place. I said, yeah, it'd be nice, Mayor, but this is all we got this year. I've built something for us. And he said, I'll tell you what, I'll work it out. Thus we're here. And nothing said it. He hadn't uh, went down on his word since. Whenever we come, whatever side we did, he put it inside. And he thinks that it's important enough for us to celebrate black history, to put everything that's on our schedule for this particular center, to move it aside and let us come here today. So thank you, Mayor. We have Brenda Velasco with us today. She's a councilwoman at large. I can't tell you how, how much help Brenda is to us every single day. She supports the Indian Club, Indian Pitney Club more than I do. She's probably there more than me, too. Thank you, Bill. I'm honored to be here and to see this great, be part of this great community. Uh, how many of you are under 50 in this audience? <laughs>
set the tone of the occasion. Black History and on the Underground Railroad at Keene University. 
In the spring of 2005, she was hired as a research coordinator for an underground railroad project funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Under the auspices of the Center for Anti-Slavery Studies, headquartered in Montrose, Pennsylvania, she compiled a comprehensive set, set of facts which documents the path of the Underground Railroad through 10 northern, northeastern Pennsylvania towns and cities wherein the tracks of the runaways had been effectively buried by the time, by time and neglect. In 2006, she wrote the foreword to William Steele's classic book, The Underground Railroad, republished by Plexus Publishers and issued in 2006. In February 2011, she appeared as a commentator in the Black History Month PBS documentary, William Still and the Underground Railroad. I am honored, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you professor, researcher, writer, and author, Dr. Sarah Smith Duxworth. I 
was so impressed by all these stories of runaways and William Steele's um, commitment to uh, collecting these stories and hiding them in a crypt so that uh, he could do what was then unlegal and preserve this history. I made copies for my colleagues. And uh, <laughs> they were impressed, I'm sure. I don't think they read the whole book, though. As uh, luck would have it, Barbara Wheeler was related somehow to the uh, Steele family. And that summer, they were giving their annual uh, family reunion. And Barbara was going, and she invited me and the others to go, and I did go. And it was very impressive. I was talking about the book with some of the family members, and they were talking about the book uh, with me. And uh, they, I guess they saw my interest in, uh, their, in, in this history and in the book and the stories that I could talk about with them. Uh, they didn't forget me later on. I came back uh, really, really uh, excited. And I saw this ad for the um, uh, Center for Anti-Slavery uh, Studies. I put in an application to be their research coordinator. And they hired me, and I did this research on the Underground Railroad in 10 counties. I worked myself out of a job. I completed the project in six months, and they thought I needed two years. But it was really so uh, powerful that I couldn't stop. I worked around the clock. It was spring and summer. And by the fall, I could give them what they wanted. Uh, after that, um, I just um, was approached to before that. I'm sorry. The reason why they uh, hired me in the first place, I think, because the Steele family did not forget me. And um, we were asked to write the forward to the Underground Railroad. And um, we had about five people working on that Underground Railroad forward. And when they saw it, we had about five different voices, and they said, we can't use this. So the committee thought about it and elected me to write the forward. And I think that was the reason why I was hired by the uh, Center for Slavery Studies. Um, so the Underground Railroad has become, become one of my biggest um, uh, hobbies. I continue to, to uh, think about it. And finally, I decided to write a digital story about another place where the tracks of the Underground Railroad were lost, and that was Union County. Under the aegis of Fountain Baptist Church and with a history grant from Union County, I was able to do the research in a semester and write it in another semester and present it in 2009 before a large audience at Fountain Baptist Church. I sort of put it in the drawer after that. I didn't do anything else with it except show it to uh, some of my students who were taking African American literature with me. So I'm very happy when Darlene Young called me and asked me if I would show that digital story again. I was just delighted to take it out of that drawer. I said, yes, I'll do it, because Darlene had uh, come and helped me uh, put together uh, one of the programs I produced, and she did a reenaction of Harriet Tubman, which was marvelous, and she also was at Fountain Baptist Church. So I'm so happy today to show it again. And uh, I hope the, the researchers there, it's not all that professional in the places, the pictures are a little bit grainy sometimes, but um, it is a joy to put together and I hope it will be something that you will, something in it that you will take away, some places that you will see that you recognize. So I thank you again, so happy to be here, and so we'll start the show.
the history of Union County goes back to 1664, when a small group of Englishmen purchased from Native Americans a tract of land they called Elizabeth Town, which soon became incorporated into the eastern half of New Jersey province. In 1683, when East Jersey was divided into four counties, Bergen, Essex, Middlesex, and Monmouth, the original Elizabethtown purchase was made a part of Essex County. As time passed, this same tract of land continued to divide and expand until in 1857, it reset its original boundaries, separated from Essex County, and took the name Union County. Its land mass then included one city and six towns, Elizabeth, Springfield, Westfield, Rahway, Union, New Providence, and Plainfield, respectively. Across the next 100 years, Union County neighborhoods continued to cut away from those large municipalities, so that today, Union County has a total of 21 autonomous cities, towns, and boroughs. According to Wilbur Siebert, who published the first history of the Underground Railroad in 1898, during the most active years of the Underground Railroad movement, 1830 through 1865, Union County was intimately associated with Philadelphia, a main artery of the Underground Railroad. In fact, as Siebert wrote, one of three major tracks used by runaways from the territory west of the Delaware River had a major conduit through East Jersey, beginning at the Raritan River crossing where New Brunswick and Rahway are fringed and separated by the same waters. According to Seaver, the track running through Rahway was perhaps the most important of the three routes. His main source of information came from Reverend Thomas Clement Oliver, the state's most active underground railroad guide and conductor during the last 35 years of Underground Railroad history. As we trace the Underground Railroad from Pennsylvania to Rahway, then through Elizabeth to Newark, and finally to Jersey City, we will follow a simplified track because in reality, there was no straight path. Obstacles in the form of slave catchers, spies for the South, miscommunications and illnesses often barred Freedom's Way. The Underground Railroad track leading through Union County began in Philadelphia. From Philadelphia, runaways were ferried across the Delaware to Camden, where they found safe haven at the Macedonia African Methodist Episcopal Church on Spruce Street, where Reverend Thomas Clement Oliver was once the pastor. From Camden, runaways followed the river to Burlington City in Burlington County, found finding shelter at the Burlington Pharmacy. After leaving the pharmacy, they traveled northeast to Boarding Town and then on to Princeton. From Princeton, they continued to New Brunswick and from there to the Raritan River Crossing and into Union County. The landing at New Brunswick is documented as the most treacherous point for runaways taking this track to freedom. For here, at the New Brunswick Raritan River landing, bounty hunters and spies often crowned. Fortunately, the Underground Railroad had its own sharp lookouts to circumvent the enemies of freedom. One of these lookouts was the ever-vigilant Cornelius Cornell, who lived close by the Raritan River in New Brunswick. It was Cornelius who most often alerted Underground Railroad guides crossing the river with fugitive passengers to danger. 
The system Cornelius and the guides used was quite cunning. You will soon learn how it worked, but first you should know that boats carrying human contraband sailed under the cover of darkness and were marked by a yellow light hung below a blue one. Cornelius had a boat that he marked with the same colored lights. On a given night, if Cornelius had full knowledge that no bounty hunters were abroad in New Brunswick, he took his boat with its lanterns lighted out of the water. Whenever he was out fishing around the landing under the New Brunswick skies, approaching pilots with freedom-bound passengers knew it was safe to cross the landing and sail into Raleigh. From a Raleigh dock, runaways then began the next leg of their journey. Ideally, they continued across land to Elizabethtown, went through Newark, and on to Jersey City, where Quaker John Everett, or one of his Negro servants, met them and provided them with passage to New York train depot, known today as Grand Central Station. At this real train station, runaways received paper tickets for an express bound to Syracuse, New York. On the other hand, when Cornelius's boat was not sailing on the Raritan near the New Brunswick landing, an underground railroad passenger boat pilot, not seeing the all clear signal, made a detour and let the passengers off in Perth Amboy or South Amboy. From either of these towns, runaways made their way across land to waters where they caught a ferry that took them to Staten Island. From Staten Island, they traveled to Grand Central Station, boarded a real train, and rode in relative comfort to Syracuse, New York. The projection of the Underground Railroad route through Raleigh accounts for the distribution of most of the safe houses in Union County, which are mainly located in the old communities of Raleigh and Union. Harsh black codes in New Jersey which prevented land ownership by blacks, restricted their assembly in groups on town streets, and their freedom of movement without passes, and purposefully splintered families, created a lot of malcontent in both the slave and free black communities. Slaves who were more closely monitored than their free counterparts rebelled in various ways, stealing goods belonging to their so-called masters, vandalizing property, and even planning insurrections. Of course, some slaves took to the Underground Railroad to free themselves. Throughout the history of slavery in the colony, New Jersey masters worried about the likelihood of their slaves, their most valuable property, running off. Numerous bills of runaways from Essex County in general and the towns that became Union County specifically were posted in newspapers that are stored on microfilm in libraries and on the internet. This is Merchant and Drover's Tavern. Although this tavern was probably not an underground railroad station, it was a popular inn where many a slave dealer and slave catcher undoubtedly stopped for rest and good conversation. Surely they found good transportation to and from the inn, riding in one of the fine carriages manufactured with slave labor. According to period historians and modern day scholars, Raleigh in antebellum times was known as the carriage city of the world. Back then, it had over 35 thriving carriage manufacturing businesses operating to supply the South with a steady supply of fashionable carriages. Drover's Tavern stood as it still stands today, several stone throws away 
from Ebenezer African Methodist Episcopal Church, organized in 1826. This church most likely provided temporary shelter for runaways, since Reverend Thomas Clement Oliver, whose reputation for assisting the Underground Railroad, pastored the Rawlin Black Church in 1850, the year the Fugitive Slave Law mandated that average citizens become involved in catching runaways. Almost two decades after free blacks in Rawway established their AME church, a school for colored children was formed in 1844, a few doorsteps away. Its formation was made possible through a trust fund that had been established by Quaker Isabel Hartshorn Eddy in 1792. The building still stands today, though as a residential dwelling. Its porch has been enclosed with jealousy windows. The Rawway Cemetery tells more of the story of a progressive black community in Colonial Rawway. The cemetery has two stones of Ambo, a beloved servant buried with the Terrell family, and Pippinger, the popular town crier, who was well known for his booming, melodious voice and huge vocabulary. There are also a number of black Civil War soldiers buried in a segregated section of the cemetery as testament to the agency Rawway blacks pursued in ending the chokehold of chattel slavery. During colonial days, Clark was Rawway's fifth ward. Slaves as well as black indentured servants lived in many of the farmhouses in that community. The long-standing William Robinson Farm, established in 1690 and described in period and later histories as a working plantation, undoubtedly housed slaves on its premises. Four, inherent in the farm's description as a plantation, a slave labor force to support its operation is understood. The Robinson Farmhouse, restored in the mid-1970s, still bears a stately presence in Clark. The Oak Ridge Homestead on Lake Street was originally built by slaveholders Shubel and William Smith. Oral histories refer to the old slave quarters and a burial ground on its premises. From 1814 through 1881, the homestead located on Lake Street was the residence of Judge Hugh Hartshorn Bound, a prominent outspoken abolitionist. The homestead, consequently, was long rumored to have been a stop on the Underground Railroad. George Hartshorn, a cousin to Judge Hartshorn Bound, also owned a residence in Clark on Lake Street. His home was simply called the Hartshorn Farmhouse. According to historical documents, George Hartshorn's home was also a safe haven for runaways. Nestled among other dwellings belonging to abolitionist sympathizers, George Hartshorn's house, like his cousin's house, added to the reputation of the small Lake Street community where they were located. For Due to a clustering of Quakers who held anti-slavery sentiments living on that street, the entire street became known as Quakers Row. The George Loser House, established in 1732, was another Quaker house on Lake Street, reputed to be an underground railroad stop. It was located close to the Broadway River. The Loser House survived over two centuries and was finally torn down in the 1950s. Although Lake Street, or Quakers Row, was a close-knit community and its residents were basically united in anti-slavery sentiment, 
The street was not immune to invention. The Peterson Farm, established around 1778 on Lake Street, is an infamous example of the community's vulnerability to siege by pro-slavery profit takers. The idea that an illegal slave trader could and would kidnap blacks and hide them in a subcellar on Lake Street among abolitionists, even today, seems far-fetched. But rumors passed down through generations maintained that this was indeed the case until Quaker residents became aware of the criminal in their midst and evicted him from the neighborhood. Credibility to the rumor was gained in 1999 when the Peterson farmhouse was raised to make room for a modern day luxury home. And under the rubble, the secret subsequent whose existence was long suspected was finally uncovered. A main attraction in Westfield was Charles Clark's store, built about 1800 and destroyed by fire in 1889. Here is a scrapbook picture of the store with an image of Black Lou, handyman for the Clarks, taken about 1865. In the commemorative history of the Presbyterian Church in Westfield, New Jersey, 1728 through 1928, Author William K. McKinney and others wrote that during the period of slavery, most Westfield families kept Negro slaves. According to McKinney, who addressed his contemporaries in 1928, this fact was generally overlooked by residents of the town. McKinney further suggested that many of them still remembered the old slave quarters on the Gideon Ross estate. And he reminded those old timers that the Stanley Cottage, also known as Pearson Homestead, when it was built in 1801 in Westfield, had been originally occupied by a slave trader named John Sampson. In the history of Scotch Plains entitled Under the New Hills, Author Marion McNichol Rawson recalled that in Scotch Plains, the slave hut had its place on both early and later farms, two of which stood behind the old Flanders house on the Plainfield Road, and one on the old Stanbury farm. Behind the Stanbury house, according to Rawson, was a cottage in which a long line of slaves lived. Names of slaves who lived in that cottage at various times were given as Charles and Lizzie Layton, Boss Drake, and Lias Garvey. Rawson reminded his contemporaries of a once magnificent columned house torn down in the 1920s, which, according to legend, had a torture chamber for slaves in its cellar. He wrote that the raising of the house produced evidence confirming the sorry story. For, according to Rawson, the demolition uncovered a row of iron rings driven into the foundation stones of the cellar and not far from the rings cut sharply into the heavy hand-hewn ceiling timbers was the name George Washington. Years after slavery ended, George John Hatfield remembered an old iron anchor, which when he was a boy had knocked around his grandfather Zofra Hatfield's barn at Mountainside. He recalled that it was strong enough to hold an ox and that the old fella was fitted with its own key and a length of chain too carefully wrapped to give way under human muscles. 
Of course, there were many more devices other than iron anklets used to control slaves and keep them off the underground railroad. In 1741, a rumor that blacks were planning to rise up against whites surfaced and led to the burning at the stake of three blacks on the lawn of the present site of the Union County Courthouse in Elizabeth. At the foot of Elizabethtown, Negroes were frequently sold. In Hatfield's History of Elizabeth is reproduced the following notice written by one of the city's most prominent citizens. A likely parcel of Negro boys and girls from 12 to 20 years of age who have all had the smallpox to be sold by Cornelius Hetfield in Elizabethtown. The notice was published on April 27, 1757. In the middle of the second decade of the 20th century, Elizabethtown's free blacks gained access to education in their own community. According to authors of a book entitled Elizabethtown and Union County, a Victoria history, after a free school association was formed, Reverend John McDowell became superintendent in charge of the free school for both colored children and adults in 1815. The average attendance was 65 students. In 1854, the first Presbyterian Church of Elizabethtown held its organizational meeting of the African Colonization Society. The primary item on the agenda of the newly formed society was to raise funds to establish an iron industry in Liberia so that blacks who would be returned to Africa would have promise of employment. However, congregants at the Rahway Ebenezer A.M. Church had already sent a clear position on the question of blacks returning to Africa. In April 1834, free Rahway blacks held an anti-colonization meeting and drew up a resolution in which they made a number of statements against the propositions of the colonization societies that were then forming. Among their resolutions were these clear, unequivocal statements. Resolved that we will never consent to go to Africa and that we consider this country our only home. Here we were born and here we will stay. Resolved that we consider those Christians and philanthropists who are boasting of their liberty and equality, saying that all men are born free and equal, and yet are holding thousands in bondage and endeavoring to remove us from our native land, to be inhuman in their proceedings, defective in their principles, and unworthy of our confidence. The Connecticut Farms Presbyterian Church is an early white church which took a vocal stand supporting abolition. According to legend, the church may even have been an underground railroad station. One documented truth is that in the 1840s, the congregation was torn apart by the controversy over the rights of slaves to be free. The slavery debate among congregants became intensified when Reverend Robert Street became the church's pastor. His fervent anti-slavery sermons drove some congregants from the church. In 1846, a splinter group, which called themselves the Free Church, separated from the internal fray and joined forces with the Underground Railroad. William Livingston, who became the first governor of New Jersey, owned a large plantation in Elizabethtown. Cane University and the Liberty Museum 
are today located on that old plantation site. Before the Revolutionary War, Livingston owned a number of slaves. But after the war, he decided that slavery was wrong. In 1778, he tried to urge his legislature to provide gradual abolition for slaves. But members of the assembly argued the country was in too critical a situation to enter on the consideration of it at that time. The voices of hard opposition dripped with sullen sentiments. Their argument included such specious wisdom as Africans are unfit for freedom due to their deep route disposition to indolence and their want of judgment. The Liberty Museum, located across Morris Avenue in front of Kane University, was Livingston's farmhouse. On Kane University campus, the James Townley House, which according to Frank Esposito, a distinguished professor and historian at the university, was formerly used to house slaves. The Feltville development in Berkeley Heights, today called the Deserted Village, started out in 1844 as a mill town populated by recruits from the ranks of New York's poor and unemployed whites. The founder of the community, entrepreneur David Felt, a Unitarian, started the mill town to give indigents a better life with work and religion at the core. From the start, his experiment was controversial and not easily managed due to the strict rules he imposed on residents. So, after 15 years of struggle with the issues between himself and his tenants, that sold the community of that bidder to the highest bidder and moved to New York. In succeeding years, a number of different ventures were tried by different owners of the One particularly ill-advised venture was a tobacco farm for which slave labor was employed. Apparently, there were high hopes for this profitable cash crop. But those hopes were dashed when the winter in today's watch on reservation proved too harsh for growing tobacco. On November 19, 1793, according to an internet article, Polly H. 14 departed from Springfield, New Jersey, via ship Nisbet. It is noted that Polly, a fine girl, was formerly the slave of Peter Trumley. Then there was Norm Ramey, who was profiled in another internet article on slavery in Springfield. Ramey, the article reads, was of mixed heritage, part African and part Cherokee. He was attached to the household of the Denmans, who were among the earliest settlers in Springfield. Ramey lived to be over a hundred years old and was buried in Springfield Presbyterian Cemetery. The Presbyterian Church of Springfield undoubtedly had a few abolition sympathizers. For a couple of decades after the Civil War ended, the church superintendent invited Sojourner Truth to speak to the congregants. More revealing of possible abolition sentiments in Springfield is an internet source which identifies a Reverend Stone, a preacher at the Springfield Church and later an army chaplain, as one who spoke out against slavery. Prominent in Springfield is the Cannonball House, the home of a prominent doctor and his wife during the Revolutionary War period. Today, the house is the headquarters of the Springfield Historical Society. One of the interesting discoveries made in this house consists of artifacts 
that verify the fact that slaves live there. The Drake House in Plainfield, which stands today as a museum, was once the farmhouse of Nathaniel Drake. Its history goes back to 1746. At that time, the legendary Caesar worked on the Drake plantation. Caesar, freed in 1769, served in the Revolutionary War as a drover when he was over 70. He attended the Scotch Plains Baptist Church along with the Drake family and was well regarded by his fellow parishioners. However, he was not treated with the same high regard that would have been accorded a white man of his religious fervor and ability. He was blocked from becoming a trustee in the church, though his tombstone bears an impressive epitaph inscribed by church members, revealing his worthiness as a man of faith and as a man with a gift of exhortation. The Friends House, where Quakers held their meetings during the colonial days, also still stands in Plainfield. Minutes dating from 1686 give many instances of the Friends' concern with the ethics of owning slaves. Early in the history of slavery, individual Quakers began freeing their slaves as a matter of conscience. However, as a body, they were reluctant to join the abolition movement and did not allow their meeting house in Plainfield to be used as a venue for abolition meetings. Despite their intellectual acceptance of the immorality of slavery. Quakers found it difficult to accept the equality of blacks to themselves. The evidence of race prejudice in the House of Quakers has been the subject of various texts. Among them is the research findings of New Jersey historian Henry J. Cadbury, who wrote that in the Friends House, Negroes usually sat in a special place against the wall, under the stairs, or in the gallery. Various other researchers cite evidence that it was difficult for Negroes to become members of the Quaker set. They refer to rare cases of colored members, but document that for a black to become a member, it took long periods of consideration and many referrings to superior meetings. A case in point was that of Cynthia Myers, a mulatto woman who lived in Plainfield, and having all the qualifications for Quaker membership, tried for over a year to join the sect before she was finally admitted. The city and townships that separated from Essex County in 1857 to become Union County had a long history of being united, beginning when their boundaries were set by the original 1664 Elizabeth Town Purchase. Geographically, Union County was in the path of the National Underground Railroad. It was therefore well positioned for Underground Railroad activity. Although black codes limited the formation of strong black communities in colonial Union County, the increasing presence of free blacks attached to white households and white businesses after 1804 created a new awareness of the preciousness of liberty that would have made blacks the natural sympathizers of runaways. Though the record is fair, it can be inferred that Union County free blacks played an important role in assisting the Underground Railroad. Only one Union County African American, Brave Joseph Garrison, has been memorialized in the annals of Underground Railroad history as an Underground Railroad agent. But since helping runaways was a crime, 
with stiff penalties attached, it is clear that the greater number of black men and women who may have aided freedom's cause were long ago consigned to the graveyard of history. Which helps residents find employment and 
Southern Privilege Boy in the town. Kyle meets regular complete with the African American Coalition of Fort Ridge, the Independent Club of Colonia, and the Frank Damboy chapter of the NAACP to ensure that the residents of the township continue to be informed and represented. In January 2014, Kyle was voted council president by his peers in the council and president who serves in that capacity. Professionally, Kyle has worked in the medical field for the last 15 years in sales and business development. Presently, he is director of business development for an active reference medical lab. Mr. Kyle Anderson, would you and your family please approach the stage? Okay. 
okay? That's why we're here. We are Americans. That's what we've been asking for for, for centuries, is to be included because we helped build this country. And so we'll hear about how Black History Month should go away, and how we should just have American history, and we should be included in that history. But it is important that we take this time because it's our time to reflect and to acknowledge our accomplishments. Uh, but I do want to thank so many people for being here. Uh, my friends on the council, former friends on the council, state assemblymen, um, the mayor, of course, um, a lot of the community people, Mr. Warren, the Independent Club of Pony, and all of you um, for just taking this time to, I have to get a copy of the slideshow. I like the music in the background, but, um, <laughs> you know, and, and more, more, most importantly, my family and my loving wife um, who have supported uh, everything that um, I've stood for. And, um, you know, I just really want to say thank you. It's just, um, I, didn't, I didn't anticipate. Now that I'm looking at it, my wife was, showing me something on her phone the other day, and I saw one of my childhood pictures, and I go, what would you scan that thing for? I thought she was doing it for Throwback Thursday on Facebook or something. <laughs> and, uh, now I realize that's where it is. <laughs> but um, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yoked two by two with 
chains and shackles around their ankles. A fat, slippery rope is wrapped around the women's neck. The afraid children cling to the dangling ropes that bind them together. There, at the auction block, a sea of the most revolting scenes of cruelty took place. Whips, chains, bloodhound are the cause, are the instruments present as, as, as implements of, of torture. The heard and unheard cries of mothers and their children were caught breaking hearts to bleed. Get em, 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 Jesus, Ooh. it would be all right. 
Native dance was not allowed in the church. White spirited slaves would communicate secret messages through their art form and plan a revolt since dancing was thought to be irreligious. The ring shout was developed. Worshippers link arms and shuffle in a circle singing hymn or chanted as they moved.
give us the liquor. They give us the liquor. Let me see, that's good. And say, that's good. See, that's good. And say, that's good. Enough for. Nick. At the invisible churches, you can freely sing as much as you please. It's one, two, three. Just listen to what I
very much, uh, Darlene and Jeff. Darlene and I, I guess some of you know, we go way back. We grew up together here in Colonia. Our backyards more or less, you know, backed up to each other, back to back. Um, please be sure to read their bios in your souvenir journals. As you will see, there are extensive credits to both Darlene and Jeff, uh, some of which uh, include Ragtime and Showboat, mm -hmm. Ain't Misbehaving, and Little Shop of Horrors, and Porgy and Bess, and the list goes on and on. So um, normally I would have introduced both Darlene and Jeff, and Darlene was like, no, no, don't introduce us. We'll just go ahead and start right away. So, But I do want you to at least acknowledge their bios and their professionalism, as you can see. Did you all enjoy that? And at this time also, I would like uh, for everyone to uh, take a look in the back there. We have a couple of vendors back there. And by all means, please support our vendors. They are very important to us. And they also help to put on a event such as this. Uh, we have jewelry back there, we have clothing, and even cookies, so you never know. Okay. Okay, next we are going to introduce to you Elder Lee Warren, who some of you may know the name as he is the former principal of Woodbridge High School, and he is also a neighbor of ours in Colonia, right here on Willow Street. So. Please put your hands together for Elder Lee Warren. Executive producer and vice president. 
Investment for BET. That's Black Entertainment Television. and Grammy-nominated singer, Jesse Powell. <laughs> Truly, Kyle is a man of distinction. Give my hand. John, well done, Kyle. Come on, come on, let's go.
If our children learn about their rich history, they will expect to succeed. And I'm big on that. Positive expectation. Many of you know me as a coach. I tell the kids, take the field expecting to win. If you expect to lose, you will. I will add live a little bit sometimes. There's a great philosopher that once said, a man will expect to fail, and another man will expect to uh, expect to succeed, and another man will expect to fail. Both will be correct. When I think of historical moments in a certain field, I also like to consider how the history has directly impacted me or those around me, and that's why that slide presentation about. Union County being so close in the underground, uh, underground Railroad, it's important for our children to know about the history because we see people in history books and we've walked the same path that they've walked. And it's important for them to see that history is all around them and they just have to know. So when they go somewhere to another part of town, they can, they can say, yeah, this is what I saw. This is where the Underground Railroad started, in Broadway, our neighboring town. It's important for our children to know that there's history all around them and among them. So I like to think of history, when I think of a field, I like to think of how it directly has influenced my life or those around me. It's not that we like to brag in my family, but we like to think that we can do that too. So if Someone was, as we mentioned, my uncle did some great things in the military, did some great things in the field of medicine, did some great things in the field of law. When we hear about those things, we say, well, we've got Uncle Joe, okay? And that's how we like to think. It's, not, it's about building your confidence with our children and letting them know you can do that too. For instance, in education, I think of Mary McLeod Bethune, considered the first lady of the struggle because of her commitment to bettering African Americans. Born to slaves, she self-educated herself with hopes to become a missionary in Africa. When that did not materialize, she started a small school for girls in Dayton, Florida, in Daytona, Florida. She later merged that school with a boys' school to, uh, to form Bethune-Cookman University, where she served as president for many years. McLeod Bethune was the ancestor of one of my JFK classmates and dear friends, who is in the audience today that I didn't expect to be in the audience, um, Kyle Tucker. Kyle, would you just please thank I remember, I remember as a teenager when Kyle and I met, and, um, I would walk in the hallway of his, uh, his mother's home, and there was a beautiful framed picture of Mary McLeod Bethune, and it would strike up a conversation. Constable, that's like a great, great aunt of mine, and I, I just thought, wow, is it, that's fantastic to, to have someone in your life and that you can look to and say that's where the leadership comes from. But it's because of our ancestors that laid the foundation that makes it easy for us to pursue sometimes in the same field. Because Kyle's mother was also an educator, his aunt was also an ed educator, and many of them were administrators in the field of education. It wasn't by accident Dr. Cloud Bethune's relative and also Kyle's brother, Kevin Tucker, graduated valedictorian from Glen Ridge High School. Lost my place for a second. Kevin earned a scholarship to the Wharton Business School, which is in the Ivy League at University of Pennsylvania and is now a top executive at Heineken. And at our barbecues, he does bring some Amstel light and 
It's a nice perk. Kyle is also president and CEO of a booming appraisal firm in Central Jersey. And that did not happen by accident. Sticking with education, Colonia's own Mr. Lee Warren became the township's first black principal many years ago. Not that one, though, but. Since Mr. Warren became a principal, he mentored several others to help them realize their dreams. Mr. Kevin Harris, who is the vice, president, uh, vice principal at Woodbridge Middle School. One of our former police officers, now vice principal at Woodbridge High School, Mr. Abdul Salim Hassan, who was here, and I told him when he was leaving out the door, I said, I'm going to mention you. So he owes me a check. <laughs> Stephanie West, who is the principal at Lafayette, Lafayette State School, all have benefited from the doors he kept open and the knowledge he shared with them. Our township also saw our first African American school board member, Ms. Monica Michelle Smith. She was up here to introduce me before for the Black Historical Moment. And even my dear friend, Lamont Rebellet, the principal at Carteret High School, has told me about the mentorship that Mr. Warren gave him during his formative years as a school administrator. These folks all have a debt of gratitude to Mr. Warren because when you're the first, it's a lonely road and never, never an easy one. Education in our house was known to be the key to success. So when my older sister Lynn was told she was the first black person at John F. Kennedy High School to be ranked in the school's top 20, we were not surprised. But it had nothing to do with her being black. It had everything to do with our positive expectations as a family. The same held true for when she passed the CPA exam on the first try and secured a job with the top firm, Tooth Ross. Many of you know that I was a neighbor of Alvin P. Williams, a Woodbridge Township police officer, who on September 6, 1979, gave his life in an attempt to, to rescue two children from drowning during the effects of a hurricane that had swept through the area. Mr. Williams has always been one of my heroes. Today, we have Detective Eric Ransom, Detective Mark Zeno, Patrolman Brian Joseph, as well Mr. Hassan, who I mentioned, soon to be Dr. Hassan, who retired from the Township Police Department. In Middlesex County, we celebrated Billy Scott as not only our first African American, but the first woman sheriff in Middlesex County. All of these officers have achieved their greatness because of their commitment to excellence. Now this is where the rough part I have to go from my laptop. <laughs> Vivian Theodore Thomas. Without an education, became the first person to perform cardiac surgery on a white person. Without an education, cardiac surgery, pioneer and teacher of operative techniques to many of the country's most prominent surgeons, Vivian Thomas was the first African American without a doctor to perform open heart surgery. You may have seen the movie, it was something the Lord made. Well, without them, and as I said, I like to associate these historical moments to something that I can connect to. So without him, and somebody to blaze that trail, there is no John Anderson, my uncle, an officer, a, a, a person with a 40-year career in healthcare. He's been recognized as a leader, innovator, mentor in the fields of hospital administration. MD, JP, CPE, FACPE, FCLM, Executive Vice President at InnoMedic. 
He's also in Omedics consultant in quality management and improvement in the NASA Medical Quality Program for Occupational Health Services at NASA Langley Research in Hampton, Virginia, and NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida. A graduate of the University of Chicago, via a BS in Biological Science. Howard University College of Medicine and the Ventura College of Law in California. And I know I gave him my notes that he was a lieutenant colonel. He was a full colonel, I stand corrected. After completing a 30-year career in the United States Air Force, Dr. Anderson retired in the rank of colonel in 1993. He's board certified in both radiology and legal medicine. It's always been an inspiration in our life. Mr. Warren mentioned that my cousin, Jesse Powell, had a Grammy-nominated song called You. That was my cousin, Jesse Powell, but without Marian Anderson, How does Jesse Powell do what he did? She's one of the most celebrated singers of the 20th century. She's no relation, same last name, no relation, though I like to claim her. <laughs> Anderson became an important figure in the struggle of black artists to overcome racial prejudice in the United States during the mid 20th century. In 1939, the Daughters of the American Revolution refused her permission for Anderson to sing at an integrated audience in Constitutional Hall. The incident placed her into the spotlight of the international community on a level unusual for a classical musician. With the aid of First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt and her husband Franklin Roosevelt, Anderson performed a critically acclaimed open-air concert on Easter Sunday, 1939, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. She sang before a crowd of more than 75,000 people and a radio audience in the millions. So when we talk about blazing a trail, think about Marion In the area of technology, Mr. Mark Dean was a computer scientist. He's an American inventor and a computer engineer. He was part of the team that developed the ISA bus, and he led the design team for making a one gigahertz computer processor chip. He also holds three of IBM's original nine PC patents. Dean is the first African American to become an IBM fellow which is the highest level of tech, uh, technical excellence in the company. In 1997, he was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. Without Mark Dean, there is no Denise Anderson, my wife, who has a degree in computer science. I guess you'll talk about my life. But, who actually stayed up the entire night working on a code, talking with people all over the country throughout the night to make sure that her code went through. She works for a Fortune 500 company, ADP. I've seen where she's done the coding for the paychecks for the New York Yankees. And true to her honor, no matter how many times I've asked her, to help me increase my paycheck, <laughs> she won't do it. I've looked over her shoulders at times to see what she's typing. And she does it all from our kitchen because nowadays with telecommuting, you think that somebody's a homemaker and they're actually a computer scientist. And I look over her shoulder and I have no idea what she's typing. I can't understand a thing of what she's done. But for 20 years, she's done that and done it well. But without Mark Dean, perhaps Denise Anderson doesn't go into computer science.
just up the road, a woman by the name of Gail Fisher. Grew up in Potter's Crossing. She won an Emmy in 1970 for her portrayal of Peggy Fair, the secretary of the gumshoe played by Mike Connors on the CBS television series Mannix. Quote from Miss Fisher, blacks were pretty much alien objects on TV as recently as 10 years ago, you know? And now, we're people. I think maybe before it's all over, it's going to be all right. And I'm proud to be part of that. The series, one of the most violent and long, longest running of its era, began in September 1967 and continued until August of 1975. After the first year, to counteract unimpressive ratings, Mannix was changed, and Peggy Fair, the widow of a police officer who had been a friend of Joe Mannix, was added to the cast. It really was a revolution in casting. It was re really revolution in casting, you know, Ms. Fester said. It was understood by all of us who had auditioned. The girl could be anything, oriental, black, anything, just a human being, and I won. Ms. Fisher was also the proud, proud of another achievement. I was the first black female, no make that black, period, to make a national TV commercial on camera, with lines, she said, referring to a pitch for a detergent all in the early 60s. Her achievements bucked the scourge. My friends and family thought I was crazy, she says. You know, but honey, there ain't nothing like black actors. But she was determined to be one. She was born in Orange, New Jersey, and grew up in Potter's Crossing, a black section of Ed Edison Township. She was one of five children, and Miss Fisher's mother was a lot like my family. She was a great lady who brought me up to know that there is no such thing as I can't. Without Miss Fisher, there is no Donna Anderson, my cousin, who was the VP at BET, Black Entertainment Television. Executive producer of Click Tips, producer of The Real McCain, executive producer of Remixed, supervising producer of Queer Eye for the Straight Girl, senior producer for Star Search 2, Supervising producer of Classmates One, producer of Essentials, producer of Big Brother Brother Three, producer of Modern Marvels Nine, producer of Celeb vs. Celeb on AMC, producer of Modern Marvels Modern Marvels Air Shows Eight, producer of The Real Husbands of Hollywood, incurable. Senior producer, incurable collector, senior producer of The Ultimate, and producer of The Ultimate, 10 legendary heists. Without Jackie Robinson, I look in the room and I have lots of great actors. There is no James Hammers. There's no Ron Allen. There is no Glenn Morgan. There is no Mike Payne. Because somebody had to be the first. Ron, James, Mike, all, all state athletes. All record breakers. Glenn, first black quarterback, Columbia High School. I was first black quarterback at Kennedy High School. <laughs> but he did it before I did it. So he gets that. And as you mentioned, yes, my grandfather was a coal miner. And an entrepreneur. And never needed from anyone else. He moved up here with a sixth grade education and made a living for his five children 
without ever needing someone to tell him where he needed to go for a job. Because if there wasn't a job, he made one. He created one. He found a market. And yes, my father did start out parking cars and rose to be senior vice president of his company. And we had to work there every summer. <laughs> and then the legacy has to get passed on. Mr. Warren mentioned Denise and I being parents of Woodbridge High School students. We're the proud parents of five. My son Kyle was a scholar at Woodbridge High School. He earned 11 varsity letters. You could only get 12. <laughs> Okay. Olivia just became an All-American cheerleader and was recently recognized for being in the top 7% of her class. <laughs> Naya is in middle school. She's also a top student. And she's a national runner-up in, in the sport of cheer. And my twins, Ryan and Derek, they are two of the top readers in their class. <laughs> we had Family Teacher Day the other day. <laughs> to take some words from Carter G. Woodson, our founder of Black History Month, the world does not want and will never have the heroes and heroines of the past. What this age needs is an enlightened youth, not to undertake the task like theirs, but to imbibe the spirit of these great men and women and answer the present call of duty. Black history, it's a struggle, and courage was not the same as getting stuck in the past. But if we're going to understand the present and protect the future, we must understand where we came from and what it took for us to get here. Black History Month is not just for black Americans. It is for all Americans, as we are the tipping point of a country where the majority of our children are non-white. Black history is American history. We can all be inspired by the progress made, but clear about the progress that still remains to be made if we are going to move forward. We should use the extraordinary leaders from our history as examples to help us with the critical task of preparing this generation of children to be the new leaders of our community that the nation needs right now. Thank you very much. if I didn't mention some of the accomplishments in my own family, because I'm jealous. I admit I am the proud single mother of a son who is a doctor of internal medicine on Capitol Hill, Washington, D.C., by way of Cornell University, for those of you who know, that is Ivy League, and Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. He met his sweetheart in medical school at Morehouse and he married the beautiful Isfahan Chambers, who is the granddaughter of Paul Chambers, I don't know if you're a jazz enthusiast, uh, who was the bassist for uh, Miles Davis and John Coltrane. Anyway, she has a PhD, she's also a doctor, she has a PhD in molecular genetics from Morehouse also by way of Mega Evers College in New York. And my daughter Lindsay just graduated from uh, college in Rhode Island, Johnson and Wales, and she did it in 3.5 years. Um, in part due to a uh, summer studying abroad in Spain. So I just had to say all that. You know. So here's Kyle, okay? Okay, at this time, uh, we would also be remiss 
remiss if we didn't acknowledge uh, Congressman Pallone, who is here with us, and we're asking that he says just a couple of words. Thank you very much. I know the hour is late. The program's almost over. But I just wanted to say, and I came late, I just came in from Washington, and I was listening to um, what was said. I thought the most interesting thing was the, the reference to Marian Anderson, because a lot of times I go to events at the Daughters of American Revolution Hall. It's news now for all kinds of events. And I was thinking when it was mentioned that 1939, uh, they were still discriminating and not allowing Marian Anderson to sing there. Think about the fact that, and this is my own message, it, it was said about how the struggle continues. It is. And that's why it's important to have the independent club, to have this celebration every year. I guess it's the fourth year now, I don't know how many years. You, you must continue to do it because you must continue to be vigilant. 1939 was what, 50 or 60 years after the Civil War, after the 14th and 15th Amendments. And what is the Daughters of American Revolution? to celebrate the American Revolution, the Constitution, all men are created equal. Yet, what, hundreds of years after, we don't know. Um, that was still not true. They still would celebrate the American Revolution, but not allow Marian Anderson to sing. And the fact of the matter is, we have come, we have come a long way, uh, but we still have a long way to go, and we still have to worry about backtracking. You know, in the aftermath of uh, the Civil War, we, we had Jim Crow laws. And right now in Washington, we're trying to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act uh, because we don't want to slide back to something like Jim Crow with things like voter IDs or other ways of trying to make it more difficult for African Americans or minorities to vote. And we talk about education, but at the federal level in Washington, we're not doing that much these days, even though the president's trying as much as he can to provide a funding for scholarships and student loans. Those things have been cut back. They haven't been increased to keep up with inflation. So it's probably more difficult today than it was 10 or 20 years ago to say that we have equal opportunities for education here in this country. And we've made a lot of progress. You know, the president passed the Affordable Care Act, or some people call it Obamacare, and that's being implemented right now. But I'll tell you, there are many in Congress right now who are trying to still repeal it or cut back on it or make it not applicable or cut the funding. So if anyone here thinks that the struggle isn't over, and I'm sure you don't, uh, let me tell you, coming in from Washington, it's not. The struggle continues. And it's very important to talk about those leaders and those uh, people who we celebrate uh, in this nation's history who made the struggle and who made it possible for us to get where we are today. Uh, but in order for that progress to continue, we have to continue to be vigilant. And that's why it's very important that you can continue to have these celebrations every year. Not only to talk about the past, but to talk about those that I mentioned in the future uh, that will continue. The President, uh, this is the last thing I say, the President of uh, the State of the Union Address talked about uh, inequality uh, in, in, in many ways. The fact that the middle class is shrinking. Uh, the fact that the idea of equal opportunity shouldn't be lost. Uh, and we have to make sure that we carry that out for future generations. This is the country of equal opportunity. Not everybody's born the same, not, not everybody dies the same. But while you're here, you should have that opportunity. And that's in the that political struggle, in the economic struggle, in the social struggle, whatever. Uh, so let's continue to keep that dream alive. And thank you for doing this and that's why you. Thank you very much. Congressman Pallone. Um, next, we're going to hear just a few words from uh, Attorney Ronald Spivak on voting rights. I don't know if you all have been reading a newspaper or looking at the news, and these are some dire times for people who look like you and me. So, Attorney Spivak will come give a few words about what's going on and how we can at least support efforts to circumvent the efforts. Thank you. Just a few brief words. The civil rights structure, civil rights fight continues, maybe at a different level, maybe not so obvious, but it still continues. Let me review a little bit. 
Before 1964, voting rights act passed by Lyndon Johnson's Congress, the South and other parts of the country did many things to diminish and eliminate votes by minority people or poor people. They had the poll tax, which eventually ruled unconstitutional. They had people who had to test you before you voted, such a person would see if you knew enough about the constitutional law, and if you didn't know enough, they didn't permit you to vote. That all changed in 1964. But now we have a new attack on voting rights. It's for the public benefit that more people participate in the system, that more people vote, that more people are involved in our country, not less. But certain states, and you'd be surprised with states, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and many southern states are now passing voter ID laws. This is made to eliminate votes, to diminish the votes of black and other minority peoples. They also have other tricks on their uh, way. They're shortening the time period for absentee voting. Ohio, which had great problems in uh, voting last elections because of backlog, because of people waiting hours in line to vote, what did they do now? They passed a law lessening, diminishing the number of voting booths, making it harder to vote. So the battle has not been won. It still continues, and we have a new attack by trying to eliminate the voting with these type of restrictive state laws. They are being fought in the court, some of them are being overturned, some are still being litigated. And you'll be surprised what states are pushing this. States generally with Republican governors. The 1954 Voting Act was in some diminished manner lessened, restricted by the recent Supreme Court decision. A Supreme Court decision voting five to four, five Republican appointees voted to restrict and lessen the 1964 Voting Act. So the, watch your papers, read about it, get concerned, because they're trying to take away your right to vote. They're trying to eliminate your influence in the political system. And it's a very terrible thing. It's contrary to democratic principles. Thank you very much.
beautiful service today. And Lord God, we thank you for the food that we are about to receive. We ask that you to cheer by and sanctify it. Bless the hands that were there and the cooks that cooked it. In the name of Jesus. And Lord God, after we eat and when we leave this place, we ask you to go with us. Now, take control of the spirit world as we travel and go back into a world that has changed since we've been in here. And Lord God, you do these things for us. We will forever give your name the praise and the glory and the honor shall be thy. In Jesus' name we pray that everybody say amen. amen. I'm going to support the family.